Hi, thank you for joining us for Law Talk Friday with our guests, Community Organization, Independence Heights Redevelopment Council. We're presenting today on inherited property preservation. And I would love to um, start off by introducing our speakers that we have for today. Myself, um, Ashia Jones-Brown, I'm a staff attorney with the community advocacy team. Um, that's a part of the Equitable Development Initiative for Lone Star Legal Aid. I am joined by our esteemed guest, Ms. Tanya DeBose. She's the ex Executive Director for Independence Heights Redevelopment Council, as well as um, Amy Von Bocal, and she's a paralegal for the Fair Housing Team with EDI and Lone Star Legal Aid. And I'll allow both of them to introduce themselves and let you know a little bit more about them. Sure, thank you, Ashia. Um, as uh, she said, I am Tanya DeBose. I'm the executive director of the Independence Heights Redevelopment Council. Uh, we were founded uh, right after uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Um, our organization's mission is to improve the quality of life for those people in Independence Heights by empowering the people of the community to be the change agents. Um, our work centers around developing community plans, but not just developing them, implementing them. And uh, daily we encounter some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. So I'm happy to be here. Welcome, Tanya. And I'm Amy Von Bokel, and I work at Legal Aid in the Fair Housing Division. And I have also been working with Tanya DeBose and the Independence Heights Redevelopment Council for some years um, as a historian, just helping to research the history of the community. And I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you again for both joining, joining us for Law Talk Friday. And uh, we hope that this is gonna be an interesting conversation that starts a conversation or continues a conversation with the independent types community. So um, again, as an introduction, as an introduction uh, we, we are members, Amy and I of um, EDI at Lone Star Legal Aid or LSLA. Um, EDI is a project that was started several years ago um, and it seeks to create safe, healthy and affordable communities where people have the opportunity to thrive. Our um, initiative focuses on fair treatment and making sure everyone can participate in and benefit from the decisions that shape their neighborhoods. The project revolves around three initiatives, the environmental justice initiative, fair housing, as well as community advocacy. And with these programs, um, we're focusing more on our community impact. Uh, we're trying to assist community leaders like our guest speaker today, Mr. Bose, to um, come up with advocacy, whether it's litigation, transactional, or community lawyering based uh, solutions in these three different areas um, to help improve their communities, um, to make them stronger, um, and to improve and uh, encourage citizens to advocate for themselves. So, uh, oh, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you. I think I'm still seeing the first slide, and I wonder if you, it sounds like you're talking about the third slide. And I also wanted to um can i say can i say the part about how this presentation is intended to serve as information or did you want to say that oh sure, sure you can say that that was my next thing but you oh, can okay yes. great but are you um are you seeing the inherited property protection slide right now i'm not okay i'm gonna stop sharing and then start back sharing again okay okay um so the the legal disclaimer that i wanted to make sure we covered that i interrupted you before you got to sorry mm -hmm. about that is um, just to say that this presentation is intended to serve as legal information and does not replace legal advice. If you want more information, you can contact Lone Star Legal Aid at 1-800-733-8394 or go to www.lonestarlegal.org for more information on legal assistance. Are you able to see my screen? I am, but it's not in presentation mode. Okay, I will change that. I just want to make sure that you could see it. Oh yeah, there we go. I think I have to adjust mine so I see it fit to window. Yeah. It's in presentation mode, we're looking at it here. Thank you. So our presentation today um, is entitled Inherited Property Protection, and we are going to discuss legal tools for protecting family homes. 
a common term that we uh, refer to um, at EDI, and sometimes you might hear in the community, especially around disaster recovery time, is air property or air property owners. So what is an air property owner? Um, an air property owner is someone um, who inherited their primary residence or inherited property by will, a transfer on death deed, or intestacy. Intestacy is a legal term um, that refers to an ownership interest um, that is received by uh, law from um, a deceased person's heirs, um, and those heirs are entitled to property um, that the, their family member or deceased person may leave behind and without a will that states who that this property should go to. Again, to give you more information about intestacy, um, intestacy is the legal process that governs who inherits a home or property. Uh, when a homeowner dies again without a will or a transfer on death deed that we'll discuss later, um, you may hear this common term if you're in an air property situation where you have legal title or you know legal title to the deceased person's home passes to his or her relatives under state laws, um, a deceased person's spouse or children. Um, and these relatives become the new owners of a property upon the original homeowner or property owner's death. In order to assist um, individuals who have inherited property, there are four tools that we are focused on and we'll introduce today um, to assist with air property issues and concerns. Um, the first is an affidavit of airship, consolidate ownership or transfer of ownership um, if necessary or if desired by um, property owners, a homestead exemption form that reduces your property tax liability as well as a transfer on death deeds. And these tools that we um, are introducing today are tools that um, reduce probate costs or eliminate probate costs uh, related to property. Um, it's also a way to assist family members who have died without a will and the property um, that they owned remains in the state of your deceased loved one or remains in your deceased loved one's um, name, whether it's HCAD or whether it's also within property records. So within EDI, we've looked at these tools. These are some transactional ways um, and less cost, less um, and more cost-effective ways to clear title, uh, to consolidate ownership for inherited property. So uh, the first tool that we uh, could use to assist someone who has interest in air property or inherited property is an affidavit of airship. So what is an affidavit of airship? An affidavit of airship is a legal form that is recognized in the state of Texas that can be used to transfer interest or to show an heir's interest in property that they may have inherited um, from a loved one. A loved one um, died either without a will or they did die with a will and provided instructions on how to transfer property. However, however that will was not probated um, within four years. So. For example, a loved one may have a will. They've been deceased for more than four years. Um, if that will has not been probated or taken to court to have a judgment regarding that will, um, you could be in a situation where an affidavit of airship could benefit you. So when is an affidavit of airship used? It's used when a homeowner dies and leaves behind property. An affidavit of airship be, can be used to transfer property to their heirs at law. Most of the time, an affidavit of airship is used when the owner did not leave a will. But as I stated before, it could, in certain circumstances, be used when someone's will has not been probated. So, so where do you file an affidavit of airship? Within the state of Texas, the affidavits of airship, um, once they are properly executed, are filed with the county clerk. Um, the filing fees are very minimum when you compare them to the cost of probate, the cost of possibly retaining an attorney. Um, and it's uh, a way in order to easily or an easier way to show um, an heir's interest in a property or an entitlement to a property interest. An example here that we have, um, it's a family of five. Um, it was uh, Betty and Robert were married and during their marriage, they had three children, sister, brother, and Cheryl. Cheryl, uh, in our example, she currently lives in the property and she's 
she has this issue where she says she needs clear title. Um, in her is issue, she could have been involved in a disaster recovery um, a issue where she could be entitled to disaster assistance, but she wants clear title. Or she would, may want to take out a loan on her home to um, improve, to make home improvements, like put a new roof on um, or just make it um, uh, and, and a better home to live in uh, because she's lived there all of her life. Amy, did you have um, a question? It just occurs to me, um, Tanya might know some other reasons why people would need a clear title. I don't know if now is a good time to bring her in on that. Sure, yes. Go ahead, Ashia. Okay. Okay, um, <laughs> okay. so um, Betty and Robert were married. They had three children during their marriage. They neither had children from any other uh, relationships um, during their life. Betty and Robert are now deceased. Uh, Robert died before his wife um, and properly transferred his interest in the property to his wife, Betty. Unfortunately, now Betty is deceased and um, the only asset that she had um, was her home. She did not have any other assets to transfer. As you can see here, we posted an example of what an affidavit of airship is. It's a simple form um, that um, if, if you qualify for our services as um, we are, uh, we provide free legal services to individuals who qualify based on their income and assets. This is something that we could potentially assist you with, um, but it's an affidavit of airship as you see here. Uh, there's information that is required uh, to be included on this form that we would need to receive from you if, if we were able to assist you. Um, it's the names of children of the, of the deceased individual, whether that deceased individual was married ever, um, if they were married multiple times, um, if, if their spouse is still alive, um, also, um, the, the, the birth date of the individual who's deceased, um, in this, in our case, it's Betty Jackson. So we would need her name, her first spouse and only spouse is Robert Jackson. Um, we would also need the addresses of, um, Betty Jackson and Robert Jackson. So the deceased individuals, we would need their addresses to know, is this a property they lived in? Was this their residence? We would also need addresses for the children. We would need to know specifically who their parents are and, um, and also their um, date of birth and their current address. And if the children are deceased, we would need their deceased um, date information as well as their heirs if the deceased child or heir has, um, has heirs, have heirs or children as well. Um, for the affidavit of heirship, no, um, typically we, uh, the, we, you need two witnesses to confirm that everything included all this information is accurate. Um, it could be a neighbor, for example, it could be a pastor, it could be an advocate like Ms. DeBose here today, who knows pretty much everyone in her community and many of the family histories of families in her community. Um, sometimes it could be a family member if there's not another person that's not related who is very familiar with um, the deceased party, the family history, as well as known uh, resident information. Again here, this is just additional information about um, where the parents' names um, would be located on the form, the affiant, which is the witness in this particular case. And our affiant in this example is John the neighbor. He's a great neighbor for helping out um, the Jackson family. Again, this is another example to give you more detailed information of what um, the affiant or witness would be required to know. They would be required to say their name, uh, where they currently live, that they personally are familiar with the family and the marital history, if it's a person who was married, and they have personal knowledge of the facts that are included in the affidavit. Um, and so a witness would be someone that you, um, as a potential applicant or client, you, it, it would be your job to let us know who knows this information, if they would be willing to participate, and you bring us in, into the fold in terms of letting them know, and we would contact the witness uh, the potential witness to let them know this information. Um, they would also be required to sign this before notary. So they would be required to have um, proper identification as well um, and be required to confirm that the information they're providing is true and accurate. Again, this is more information about what is required and we addressed all that before about children and marriage information. 
And all of this information in terms of how it's written here is information that we would provide and explain to you. Like for example, whether a person died with a will and you know whether or not that will was probated in the required four year period. We would also need um, the property description and that's something that we would uh, assist you with as well, making sure that we have correct property description information. However, if you have deeds and, and those documents, it's always good to pre present those to anyone who is assisting you with these forms so that they have accurate information and it doesn't provide any um, wrong information uh, to the clerk's office. So in our example, the Jackson family, um, we have completed an affidavit of airship on behalf of Betty Jackson. Um, originally on, in the property records, it was listed as if um, Betty Jackson owned 100% of the estate, uh, the property records, and the Harris County Appraisal District had no um, knowledge that Betty, you know, uh, had deceased or was is now deceased and had no knowledge of her uh, heirs at law or her children that were entitled to ownership uh, now that Miss Betty has passed. And so we've completed this affidavit of heirship everything is signed and, and executed properly. So in, in our example, Sister Jackson, Brother Jackson and Cheryl Jackson now have 33% um, undivided shares in their property in independent sites. Before Ms. Jackson owned the property and now all of the siblings on the property. Because this affidavit of heirship is filed, it will generally pres be presumed to be true after it has been filed with the county clerk for at least five years. This document alone evidences your interest in the property as heirs at law. However, other individuals who may say that they are a child of Betty or have some type of interest in the property could seek to challenge the affidavit of heirship that has been filed. Our second um, tool that we would like to talk about today is a transfer of ownership. And we won't really talk much about this because it may not apply to everyone. But in our particular situation, sister and brother Jackson, they both have their own homes. Um, they may live in the area or not, but sister Jackson says, hey, she knows that mom and dad will want Cheryl to have the house. Uh, brother says he wants Cheryl to have the house. And so they've decided that because Cheryl lives there, Cheryl wants the house, she's taking care of the house or wants to continue to take care of the home. They both come to our office and say, hey, we wanna transfer our, our ownership. Is there anything you could do? You helped us with the affidavit of airship. Because you helped us with that, could you also help us transfer our interest? And that is where we would draft appropriate deeds for sister and brother to transfer their interest in the property to Cheryl. After they transfer their interest um, in the property, the house before was originally jointly owned by the three siblings. Uh, we draft deeds from Sister Jackson to Cheryl Jackson and another deed from Brother Jackson to Cheryl Jackson and they sign. They're filed properly with the, Kirk for, for the, with the clerk's office for a minimum fee and Cheryl now owns the house 100%. This may not be a tool that everyone wants to use, but if we are assisting you with your affidavit of airship, this is also something that we could assist you with if you as a family decide that one or more persons would like to transfer their interest to another uh, family member that qualifies for our services. The third tool that we uh, are gonna briefly talk about today is your homestead tax exemption. And this is a new law that has unlocked property tax savings for inherited households. And we think this is a great new addition to Texas law. It's gonna benefit a lot of our client community and a lot of community members um, like Independence Heights who may still be living and maintaining their family homes. So in 2019, there was a new Texas law that was enacted, Senate Bill 1943, and it opened up important property tax savings for air property owners. Before this uh, new bill happened, inherited property owners who were actually residing um, in family homes or inherited properties, they were only entitled to an apportioned share of the homestead tax exemption. Like for example, in our, in our example with the Jackson family, if Cheryl was the only individual our, our heir uh, purse owner living in the property, she would be entitled to a 33% share of the homestead tax exemption. Now with the new um, homestead tax exemption, Cheryl is entitled to 100% of the homestead tax exemption. And Cheryl alone, um, the other siblings could file a form as well, but only the only thing that's required is that Cheryl fill out the form that we will show you with the Harris County Appraisal District, and that will entitle um, 
entitle her or show that she's entitled to 100% of the homestead tax exemption. And this is gonna be great for individuals who are elderly, for people who are on fixed incomes, who have been saddled or riddled with increasing property values or increased property tax liability. So to show you as a self-help tool, the homestead tax exemption um, form can be found at the comptroller.texas.gov website. The, uh, the website is here on this presentation as well. Um, and this presentation will be available to you after on Facebook Live and uh, also the Lone Star Legal Aid website. So you can always go back and look here for when and if you need it. This is a form right now that you may wanna look into um, due to you know property taxes coming up. And so I would look into it and file it as soon as possible if this qualifies for you or applies to you so that you can take advantage of this homestead tax exemption for this tax year cycle for property taxes. Um, so as you can see on the website, the form is 50-114. It's an application for residence homestead tax exemption. And uh, the home, the Harris County Appraisal District also has this information as well. So you complete this form. Um, it's a form that you can complete online. If you need it actually mailed to you, if you contact the home, um, the, I'm sorry, the Harris County, Harris County Appraisal District, HCAD, they will actually mail one out to you. I was in a presentation they completed today and they assured everyone that if you give them a call, they will mail it to you and you just have to get it back to them before the deadline. All right, so for the homestead tax exemption, this is just another example and we've talked about it before under the new Senate bill um, before Cheryl would have only had a, been entitled to a 33% homestead tax exemption. Now she's a, uh, entitled to 100%, but she has to complete the form and has to turn it in before the deadline and cure any issues that HCAD says that she needs to cure. And one way to know if you've already done it, when you get your property tax form or property tax bill from Harris County or your prospective county or your prospective appraisal district, um, they, will, they should uh, let you know what exemptions you're qualified for. And if this exemption is not included on your form, that lets you know, give your appraisal district a call, uh, whatever county that you're in. I know um, you may not be located in Harris County, but give them a call and let them know what your situation is. Request the form that we let you know about if you can't, uh, if you don't have access to it online and get those forms in before the deadline. The last tool that we wanna talk about today um, as a way to assist people for alternatives um, for probate is the transfer on death deed. And this is a fairly new concept um, in Texas. It's not brand new as the homestead tax exemption is for inherited property, but it's still fairly new and some people don't know much about it. So the transfer on death deed is sometimes referred to as a Todd. And we love Todds because Todds are a simple way to transfer real estate to someone else after you die with, um, a Todd is a simple form that you can complete. And if once it's properly recorded with your local uh, county property clerk, um, your interest or your property will transfer to whoever you list on that form upon your death as a matter of law. So a transfer on death deed is a way to possibly avoid probate for a specific property. So if you don't have a will or a transfer on death deed, your real estate must go through probate court unless you qualify for using an affidavit of airship that we discussed earlier. So again, I've stated a few times, probate can be lengthy and expensive with attorney's fees and court costs paid from your estate, um, especially if you know your most expensive asset, like most individuals, is your home. How is a transfer on death deed different? Well, a transfer on death deed is different because you can avoid probate and decide in advance who should inherit your real property interest. This is not giving people control over your property before you die. Anyone that you list on a transfer on death deed does not have ownership interest in your property. They don't have a right to control what you do or what you say, or even how you sell your property. They don't have a right to um, even take a loan out on your property. A transfer on death deed can be removed at any time. You can say in our particular situation, um, We've moved on and Cheryl has 100% of her property and Cheryl could choose to leave it to her, both of her sons or one of her sons. She can today say, I want both of my sons to have it, change her mind about it and want to change it to another son or change her mind to allow, to, to list her sister or brother or both of them on the church on death deed. She can change it at any time. The form can be completed. It's a simple form. 
if you qualify for our services, um, this is a form that we could assist you with, whether you have air property or not. This is a form that prevents you from having inherited property issues once you transition, because you want to make sure that your family property and your land that you've worked so hard to maintain remains in your family or is transferred to someone that you desire, desire for it to go to. And um, it's a simple form that can be completed. Once it's completed, you file it with your Kirk and the only fees that you're responsible for are the filing fees, which are very minimum uh, filing fees. For our, in our example, um, Cheryl is now deceased. Before she died, we drafted a transfer on death deed. It was properly filed with the clerk before she died. And that's a very key point with a transfer on death deed is not valid to transfer any interest in your property until it is filed with the clerk. And it has to be filed before you transition. But because Cheryl was, was good and did not want to continue to have inherited property or transfer inherited property and continue that in her family, she uh, filed a transfer on death deed where she uh, transferred interest to both of her sons. So Cheryl is now with her loving parents and um, the property has automatically transferred to her two sons without having to go through probate. Again, the result here is um, before the transfer on death deed, if Cheryl would have chosen to pass with a will or, or not having a will, probate would have likely been required if an affidavit, if an affidavit of heirship was not appropriate in her situation. But now in, the, in this situation, probate is not required because Cheryl was great, she was active. She created an estate plan and used the transfer on death deed and her children are now uh, automatically co-owners of her home on the day that she passed as a matter of law. So in conclusion, the four tools that we are focusing on to assist uh, communities and we really wanna focus on communities like Independence Heights um, that are predominantly minority communities that have a risk history that are concerned about maintaining ownership and maintaining the community and history of their community, um, maintaining wealth in communities like African-American communities um, who have serious concerns about maintaining wealth because homeowners are not properly uh, preparing an estate plan uh, so that their property is properly transitioned from one generation or from one person to another upon their deaths. Or even if you do have an estate plan, your family may not be able to afford probate uh, uh, um, or choose not to, to probate your will um, if, if that's what happens. And in these situations, um, we can assist individuals that have inherited property by using an affidavit of heirship, consolidate ownership. If we've assisted you with that affidavit of heirship, if that's what you so choose, uh, assisting you with homestead tax exemption forms that reduce your property tax liability and obligations for your inherited property, and also transfer on death deeds for individuals who are um, concerned about who will inherit their property and to have a tool that is not a will that requires probate. So um, now we are opening it up to a question and um, answer session. And Amy, I'm gonna transfer it to you so that you can um, facilitate this portion of the presentation. Great, thank you, Ashia. Um, that was wonderful. So, so Tanya, you and I kind of brainstormed a couple questions before this Facebook Live, and um, I want to work. I want to sort of go over those with you. So, one is, could you tell us from your perspective as a community or community leader, someone who's on the ground, how important is how important are these tools, and how important is it to clear title? in your neighborhood and why? Uh, sure, thank you. It's very important to be able to clear title for homes in the neighborhood. One of the things that we found out, um, we, a couple of years ago, and this was uh, probably two years before the pandemic, but definitely after the hurricane uh, Harvey in 2017, what we saw was a lot of homes, uh, streets that, all of a sudden we wake up the next day and the whole street is filled with new front loaded garage townhomes. And we were wondering how people could go through and, and acquire that much property in such a short period of time. And what we started learning uh, was that if there is um, an absent property owner, so there's no home on the property, um, but the property has been uh, passed down to multiple heirs, 
what happens in those situations is uh, someone who has an interest in the property can buy out one of the family members and force the property into a sale. And it caught a lot of our residents and property owners off guard because in their minds, it's just simply grandma left us the house or mom left us the house. But that doesn't mean you have legal ownership of it. Um, and so we had to learn that the hard way. And so once we learned it, we also learned that there was a law that was passed, I think in 2019, that allowed for these uh, airship uh, affidavits and exemptions where people could get those signed. But there was very little PR uh, done around that. Not many people knew that this law had been passed. And so uh, given that we only had one caseworker to work Acres Homes as well as Independence Heights, um, we really tried to work with families to help them understand that and also send people over to Lone Star Legal Aid to try to get the titles cleared and to make sure that they became uh, the, the title was in a legal situation that allowed them to make decisions about the home. Because without that clear title, um, when you're using government funds, a lot of times that will disqualify you from being able to get your home fixed. Yes, that's so helpful because, you know, we've been just talking about the family, you know, and, and Cheryl and her parents, but like what you're talking about is, well, you said people think it's just grandma's home, but but they don't have legal tie ownership of it. But I think what I'm understanding from Mashia is that they do technically have legal ownership, but uh, so, uh, somebody who, who wants to kind of develop the neighborhood and buy property and just rebuild, they can they can come to one member of the family and kind of get them to peel off. And then then the rest of the family has to deal with the fact that instead of 33% sister, 33% brother, 33% Cheryl, now it's 33% stranger developer who wants to tear it down, 33% brother, 33% Cheryl. And then you're just like, have you, do you have any thoughts on that, Ashia? Well, I, I think that's why our connection in working with um, Mr. Bosa and her organization is key for this type of advocacy that we would like to do because those conversations, she's been involved in those conversations in her community. She's seen them, but sometimes when the family discusses like, what are we going to do with grandma's house? They don't think about these tools that we've talked about. So that's why we're doing this presentation. And that's why we hope to do more presentations with um, Mr. Bosa even on Zoom or even in the community so that the community members, before they're even in the position to inherit grandma's house, they know it, or before they have been approached by a developer and that one family member doesn't really know what their rights are, they can hear this information and know that there are some options for them to keep that asset, right? And so that's why I think it's important because me as an outsider, I, I didn't grow up in independent heights. Me saying these things are gonna hit differently versus you, Mr. Boston, saying, I know this family over here, grandma just passed, you know, and they may have these concerns. So, hey, let, let's, let's do a presentation or let's send them this presentation or let me talk to them about this. And then Mr. Boss, you can let us know that they're interested in speaking with us about um, maybe this being an option for them if, if they qualify for us to assist them. Right. And that and that's so important because I think during the pandemic, right after uh, Tropical Storm Imelda and prior to that, um, we had Harvey and then we had Winter Storm Yuri. Everybody is in crisis mode. And so getting people to really focus on taking care of a legal situation that would help them um, have rights to ownership in the property so that they might be able to get um, their homes repaired using federal programs and, and meeting guidelines and expectations. Um, it's, not, it's not at the forefront of their mind. And so our focus uh, with Independence Heights and working with you all is to let people know, like she has said, that there are tools available, um, that this is not in the newspapers. It is not something that's being broadcast across TV. It's not on the yellow signs that we see fill up our communities on Friday evenings until somebody drives around and picks them up on Monday mornings. Um, these, this is for those residents who are sitting in their homes that was passed down. Some of them are getting ready to be passed down. 
and so that they will know what their options are uh, to be able to maintain that home as a piece of property that is an asset and also looking at it as generational wealth. And I want to say this, you know, Independence Heights was that one place in um, the city of Houston where African-Americans pretty much owned everything with about two lots. Today, when we look at property ownership among African-Americans, um, it, it has diminished tremendously. Um, and so those who still have property, those who want to hold on to their property are looking for ways um, that they might be able to do that without having to get into an argument with a sister or another family member. These are legal tools that can be used so that they might be able to be uh, make some more responsible decisions to be able to care for the property that's being passed down um, as a part of their legacy. And one thing I'll add before you continue, Amy, is that um, nationally um, in African-American households, the average wealth is set to be zero are negative in the coming 10 to 20 years. And that's just the national scope of that. But we also are seeing incredible numbers in terms of inherited property in predominantly African-American and predominantly Hispanic communities throughout our state. Now, Lone Star Legal Aid, we're not, we don't service the entire state, but many of the more than 70 counties that we serve have pockets of communities that are historic, similar to Independence Heights, whether you're in a rural community or an urban community. And it's important that our clients, our prospective clients have say and decisions about how they can transfer their wealth. Our homes remain the most valuable asset, asset that we have in our homes. And it's not just a dollar amount, it's all those memories that you share with your grandpa, grandparents, your mother, your children, your cousins, your siblings, even business um, experiences that you may have had as a family, those things are all wrapped up in your home or in your farm or in property that your family, they died and, and they worked every day to have that property so it can be transferred. And so again, these are tools that you can preserve those memories and preserve that property so that your family will continue to have that legacy and have those memories associated with that property. I would just add that last time I checked, the average white family wealth was something like, I don't know, was it 80,000 or 200,000? It was just like- 275,000. Okay. Yeah. And so, and this is, this is part of how that happens. It's lots and lots of things, but um, this is to intervene in that huge, terrible disparity, you know, preserving property ownership is a, a powerful tool. Um, so, so Tanya, there was something I wanted to follow up on. I'll think of it later, but um, I guess I wondered if you could tell, well, you touched on, you don't want to get an argument with your sister. And so you just mm -hmm. kind of don't deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. what, what would you say are some of the other barriers that people face to, like, what are some of the other reasons that people might not deal with their inherited property? Um, sure. So uh, I'll, I'll piggyback off of what I started talking about earlier. What we have seen here recently is family members who are living in rental homes. They may want to come back to the home. The home needs some repairs. Um, it is owned by multiple um, owners, their siblings. And what happens is, is that um, some of the siblings want to go ahead and sell. And what happens is a lot of times the uh, if, if a um, I, I will say a stranger was able to get a hold to a certain percentage of that property. They will start to work with and try to uh, force the sale of this property. We've had three cases in this community alone where I've seen families who have been torn apart um, by situations where they're being pushed and forced by their siblings to sell. One of the things that we've learned about this is that um, people who want to buy into a neighborhood and get this property. Sometimes they have tools already made out um, that they will give to a family member, to a sibling, uh, to be able to really um, um, persuade the other sibling to sell. Um, they have ready-made template letters. They have a, um, a process by which they go about um, pushing these uh, information out to family members who may be a little stagnant to sell. Um, and so we've seen that, and it was really hard to believe that that was happening, but we saw it happen 
uh, to two families on one street um, and then another family uh, who lived a little bit of ways and that could not be a coincidence that the same letter um, was going out to those families. And so I would say that, you know, sometimes uh, and what we get from families in this community is that I don't want to fight with my sister. You know, she's sickly. Um, we just want to let it go. Um, you know, uh, we'll, you know, we'll figure out something where Uncle John can stay. And, and they really don't have any resources because when you look around Houston right now, you can't afford to live in Houston proper anymore. Um, and if you are going to live in Houston proper, um, it may not be a most a, a desirable spot to live in. And so, you know, what we try to do is we really try to work with them to help them to fix the home that they already own, making sure they get it into a legal status that allows them protections and so that they can benefit from that generational wealth, but also continue on uh, with the family legacy. Um, and so that that's just kind of a, a longer version of what we what we have seen in terms of um, how it how it impacts um, the social relationships or the family relationships within the family. Additionally, some of the things that we've seen happen as a result of this, um, homes get sold um, because they don't want to, or they don't have the resources, or maybe someone lives out of town um, and not having legal funds, like Ashia said, to hire an attorney, um, that can become cumbersome too. And so we see those as barriers a lot. Um, and then the final thing that I'll say is again, communication, being able to let people know that these tools are available. We don't always have the resources to get out and go door to door. Some of this, and one of the barriers that we see is that there's no house on the property. So you don't know who to mail it to because HCAD doesn't have a clear address of who you know it could be mailed to. And sometimes it's still the address where there's no building and no mailbox. And so those are some of the barriers that we do see to communicating with people who have uh, situations like this. Great, that's really helpful. And I think, um, so just to clarify, it sounds like, I mean, you said a lot of things. One of the things that I wanted to clarify is that it sounds like if someone's coming into the neighborhood, and I wanna talk a little bit more specifically about the gentrification pressures and Independence Heights, because that seems to be, it's, it's not always the, part of the issue of transferring property. But in your case, it sounds like that's a big part of how it's going down. But um, so you're saying that if if the property is valuable and someone else wants it, so let's say in our example of Cheryl and brother and sister, there are people who people who have these forms already ready and they'll come to Cheryl and say, hey, sign here, I'll give you whatever. And then it just, when you're overwhelmed and you have so many things to think about, you might just do it because they're in your face and they have it all prepared. And, um, and, and so there's like, a, there's like a formula, there's like a machine or a formula kind of coming mm -hmm. through your, your neighborhood. And that's one mm -hmm. of the things that's, that's challenging. Yeah, so gentrification is a process. And that mm -hmm. process includes many components, many things that um, all work individually, but also um, in the form of a collective, you know, processing system. And so a lot of what you see is the uh, reinterest in urban places where people can live close to downtowns and urban centers. Um, you see people who are trying to get near hiking bike trails. Um, they're trying to be within the city where they don't have to go a long way to get to grocery stores and things. And Independence Heights um, is that opportune neighborhood. Um, although we don't have grocery stores, uh, things like that in our community. And so what we're seeing is independent sites being marketed by real estate as a hot, um, you know, real estate market and, and place. And so what you see is an opportunity for people who want to buy to cash in and purchase, but also people who may not have an interest in the community and more to sell. Um, and so a part of what you see is this process starting to take effect? And I'll go back just a little bit because it's not all just you know them coming in because you do have the real estate people who are now marketing us as the heights. Um, we're independent sites. And the reason we're independent sites is because when the city of Houston was formed, the boundary of the city of Houston was just south of 16. That was the edge of the city of Houston. When the right land company began to plat the area now known as Independence Heights, 
they named it independent because it was independent of the heights. And so now we're being marketed along with other places because you've seen things like Bungalow Heights, you've seen uh, Woodland Heights, Sunset Heights. And so now people who are new here um, to Texas or to Houston, um, they're calling it, well, we live in Independence Heights thinking that it is, uh, has always been an extension of the Heights. And so we're trying to make it clear that it's not. Um, we're trying to maintain a little bit of distinction that you know this community is historic and why it is historic. So that part of the process is one. The other part of the process that we've seen is for our churches. And I know we're not talking about that, but I'm sharing the process. And what we saw right after Hurricane um, Katrina was our churches got notices. They got notices that they were in, they were not in compliance with ADA regulations. Many of them had stairs where they were told they needed um, uh, elevators. We also had them being tagged for not having proper parking spaces. Um, and then the next thing is your park. And then it comes to your school. Um, your population is dropping. Well, the population is going to drop when the population in the community starts to age. Um, and so you start to see that happening. And so it's all part of a process. But I think that uh, progress is inevitable. So we, we, we cannot stop it. But what we can do is utilize tools like what we're talking about today. That if you want to be in this neighborhood, if you want to continue to live in this neighborhood, then there are tools available for you to be able to do that. And you don't have to be afraid of them. You don't have to know it all, um, but you just need to know that there are resources that we're working on, just like what we're doing here with Lone Star Legal Aid, where you have people who are working pro bono to be able to help you navigate what's the best options for your family and your property. To get that information from an outsider who doesn't even realize that, that the reason why we're called independent sites, I would caution you before you listen to that person in terms of uh, talking about how do you transfer this generational wealth, because the wealth that they're trying to transfer is not to you, it's probably to their own selves. Thank you. I see we have a question in the chat for, I think for Shia. Should I read it out or? Okay, it says many heirs don't know about how deferred property taxes come into play following the death of their elderly loved one who may have been having their property taxes deferred. So um, I agree. I agree with this statement that many, a lot of times, um, children or heirs are not even aware that their parents or grandparents or loved one was deferring their taxes. And they don't learn about it until after they have passed away or after they start getting notices regarding the deferment and, and uh, their appraisal district is trying to collect on deferred property taxes. Now, EDI does not assist with tax uh, issues. We do have a um, foreclosure or a tax unit um, that is very great and very helpful that they could properly, possibly assist with uh, the issue that you may be having. I know all tax issues are di different and very unique um, depending on our service area and depending on where you live. But contact us. We can't even try to find a solution for you if you don't contact us and let us know you need help. If you're in the Independence Heights area and you have this issue, contact Mr. Bose. I know that her phone is always available and let her know. And she knows how to contact us or how to tell you to contact us if you don't feel comfortable speaking with us first. Um, what I will say, um, I'll take you back to that homestead tax exemption for heirs. That's one thing to look into. Um, ignoring tax deferments is not the way to go. Sometimes you wait too long. And even if we have a way to assist you, whether it's litigation or these transactional tools, we can't help you if you wait. So we're here to help you. A lot of times these air property issues are not very important until it's too late. So start addressing them now, start having the conversations. I'll say one other thing, I think we have another comment, but I know Mr. Bosch, you talked about vacant lots. Sometimes there will be vacant lots and you see a cousin or a neighbor in town for Mother's Day, for a holiday, for a graduation, and you remember they, that their family had a house on a lot. Talk to them, say, hey, what are you guys doing about that lot? Is there somebody who's interested in coming back to the neighborhood? Are you interested? Let's start having these conversations that we as a legal organization can't have those with you. Me as an individual, I don't live in your community and I'm probably misplaced to even have that conversation with you, but start having them. Mr. Bose, her organizations are very well equipped. They're very well aware about the family and neighbor and community di dynamics of these conversations, but we're here with some possible tools that can assist you. 
I can't say that these tools will apply for everyone, but if you don't start having the conversations, those who it could apply to won't get the help. Um, so Amy, did you want to talk about the other comments? It's the home, the home equity loan. Oh, well, um, okay. We'll we come back to, let's do home equity loans first and then we'll come yeah. back to the other one. Yeah, so we have, um, you know, another one. Um, I don't have the, Tanya is a caseworker who works in our office and she runs into these all the time and we are getting ready. We get everybody's title clear. We get uh, ready to try to do some things. One of the, we had this happen twice. Um, two of the seniors passed away. We're in the middle of their homes getting ready to get fixed. And all of a sudden it's a home equity loan. And the home is gonna go back to, you know, the bank or whoever the lender was that lent them. And so a lot of the family members don't know about that and, you know, if there's a, even any options. And so I know we're not talking about that today, but that was, as Amy asked me, what were some of the things that we saw um, to maintaining property in this generational wealth? That is another one because so many people doing the 80s and 90s really signed those home equity loans and it put them in a situation. And I don't know that, that there's a way out, but a year that may be something we have to deal with too, because we're losing a lot because of that also. What I will say about those home equity loans is um, just communication about what they are. I know our consumer unit at Lone Star Legal Aid um, sometimes may be able to assist or even our foreclosure unit, depending on the specific issue. Every issue is different, but I think our first thing would be to continue to communicate about what home equity loans are, what mm. they mean for your home and your property once you do transition. Because sometimes loans um, are, are predatory. I can't say what the specifics are for your community, but sometimes they are, and people are not fully aware of what they're signing and how they sign, how they sign it, and what they mean. Um, so, communication is the first thing that I that I can offer is about what they are, what they could mean, and to know exactly what you are signing. Um, and also, the second thing is estate planning knowing what a home equity line, loan or line of credit, what that will mean for your estate. Uh, also going back to deferred taxes, what that is really gonna mean for your estate. Sometimes these are tools that you need as you age. I know people are on fixed incomes and things happen, um, but that we have to know what or think through sometimes what that's gonna mean and sometimes we don't. So have those conversations with your leaders, with people you trust in your community. And if they don't have the answers, continue to ask for answers because you may be able to get general information. I know a lot of times um, people will contact Lone Star Legal Aid and we may not actually open up a case in terms of uh, a court litigation, but you may be able to get some general information on where to find more information about what you have questions about legal wise. I would just add that as this, you know, we have this big thing happening that some people are calling the Texodus where all the people from California and New York and everybody's coming here because there's no income taxes and then the property values. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, like you said, Tanya, that this, this area of Houston, it's so close to the center, it's become really valuable. And, and one thing that occurs to me, if you took out a home equity line of credit in the 80s against the value of your home, your home was probably only valued, let's say, at $70,000 or $80,000 then. And that might seem like a lot to owe but you might not realize that now your house is actually worth three or four times that. And maybe there's some way to, you know, if you can tackle it, it does, I wouldn't, I would hate for people to think, oh, you know, we owe, let's say 40,000. We'll never, how are we going to get 40,000? Well, you have it. It's in your house. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of starting to inquire. I mean, that's not something that we can necessarily help with is how to maneuver that money, but like the house, is a form of wealth and it's worth exploring how you can preserve it with before just throwing up your hands and saying thirty thousand dollars is too much i don't know do, do you guys do you guys have thoughts on that it's just something that occurred to me that i mean it's a, yeah it's a deeper part of the conversation um that needs to happen i think just understanding money understanding wealth understanding what the ancestors knew back then, owning land meant you could vote. It meant that you could hold office. 
land is the only real wealth in this world and it is the one thing that god is not making any more of and so how do you make sure that you're passing down something where you have that ownership and so i think that it's more education ashia um i i agree with you i think it's seriously about education and um and when you brought up it was the way to vote it, it was a way in terms of property ownership and that applies to our client community. Um, you know, what we were founded on initially as, a, as an organization was to provide assistance to individuals who, who are lower income and mm -hmm. who, who are in poverty. And you may have, regardless of what your race is, you may have family properties, even in rural, as I, I stated before, rural urban communities. And the foundation of our, of our country has been property ownership to give you rights to just being a 100% citizen, regardless mm -hmm. of even your color. So this applies to many people from many backgrounds, um, regardless of what you come from. And I think it's important for us to transition or switch our mind and our thoughts about the property mm -hmm. that, we own, that we are on and, and the value that it has, not just the monetary value, but the value and what it means for your family in general, from past generations to the current one and to have some power and tools to have a say on what it's gonna to say today and how it impacts your family in the future. And not just sit there and be in a tough sometimes situation. And we understand that, whether it's property taxes, whether it's knowing what to do once you've inherited property or whether it's knowing um, that you owe deferred taxes. Let, let's not let, continue to allow this to be something solid that no one talks about in our communities. Let's start having those conversations and asking questions. And it is frustrating. It is very emotional. And I know we can't necessarily cure all those family woes, but that's why we are trying to engage with the community. If you're in the Independence Heights community, Tanya DeVos is definitely our introduction into that community. If you're in another community, give us a call. If you're a leader, if you're some, if, or if this is an issue that you want to champion in your community, let us know and we can work together to see what tools your community needs. It may be the same four, it could be another one, but let us know because we're here to help. I see Melanie um, Fontenot with Bear Station. Um, Melanie is out front. Um, they're dealing with a whole, they're rural. Um, so they are dealing with a whole, um, you know, different set of rules because they're not in the city. So they don't have city ordinances. But also I see a question in the chat about medical Medicaid liens. And we've seen a couple of those um, and, and how to handle those. And I, I think, it compounds. There's all of these different kinds of uh, tools. And I like the word that you use, predatory, um, because a lot of that is predatory um, that we've seen people use. And we fall prey to it because we may be in a situation where we need some financial assistance. And so we co-sign onto these predatory type uh, uh, components or programs. And then we end up leaving that to the next generation to really have to deal with. Um, and so I think as, Chia, as you work with us and other communities, I think we're gonna see quite a bit of that. And also I do wanna speak to um, Melody. She talked about land trust. So in Independence Heights, we started a land trust back in 2012. Um, and so it was just in name only. So we formed one. Um, we had to educate and bring the community forward and what a land trust would be in order to preserve property um, in the community. It was very new. The city of Houston was not engaged in that conversation. Austin was, who already had formed one. Um, and so I think those are great tools too. And so I think this allows us to really explore tools. Um, it allows us to look at strategies that can be used to help our residents protect um, and so I would encourage anyone, because I know our hour is running out in two minutes. Um, I would also encourage anyone, if you need assistance and you're in the Independence Heights area, you can call our offices 713-904-2672. Um, leave a message um, if you call after three. And then of course, uh, Long Star Legal Aid, you can call them um, and I'll let them tell you their information. But I think that you know, tell other people, tell people who don't have social media, there are tools now that can be used to help save